Nu tänkte jag så att vi börjar med en kort film om Lucara och sen kommer William att få presentera bolaget. Vi tänkte köra ungefär en halvtimme per bolag så vi, vi tar en timme och så finns det säkert lite frågor. Och sen kommer det då i vanlig ordning att finnas smörgåsar och någonting att dricka här utanför. Så att, med det så sätter vi på den här filmen och sen kommer William komma upp och presentera Lucara. Tack så mycket! One of the key things about diamond mining is there's always the unexpected. And what we have at Grower is definitely the unexpected. One of the best productions in the world, especially if we look at the quality of diamonds which the mine is producing. I've been mining in Africa for 22 years, without a doubt, 
this is the most exciting single project that I've ever been involved in. I started with the operation from day one. I've seen it through construction, through commissioning and up to a full production. And uh, I think we have a good future here. The team has proven that it can actually put an operation in place. It can do it cost effectively and it can produce the goods. It can move the goods all the way from the mine into market, attract a loyal bunch of clients that come on a regular basis for our goods. And that will allow us to expand the company in the future. Because we actually have strong revenue being generated from the Karoe mine, it enables us to look at other opportunities which previously we wouldn't have been able to. So Karoe is really the foundation on which we see the car growing. Now, most of you know more about diamond mining than the rest of the people in the studio. So, any questions? <laughs> My presentation is done. It's the easiest one I've had to do today. Um, so, thank you very much for coming. It, it's sort of great to sort of again um, be, be back in Stockholm really to talk about diamonds. And if I talk too quickly, please raise your hand. I get very excited. It is a very passionate industry to be in. Um, and as we go through it, when we start to look at what the mining is actually generating, um, as I said in the, the little video, it's actually proving to be far better than what management could ever have actually expected. <coughs> you get that? Um, so when, when we started out um, at the beginning of the year, this was to be our first full production year. Uh, we were looking at production around about 420,000 carats, operating costs around about $23 a ton, um, which is it's not really far for the course, especially when looking at, at Southern Africa compared to sort of the much higher cost in, um, in Canada. And we started out planning only eight diamond tenders, around about 40,000, 45,000 carats a, a pop. Um, and as we've now mined the resource, we found out that we needed a couple more. And I will touch on exactly what that meant. The other project which we have out in the pipe project in Lesotho, um, we've just finished trial mining. Um, the plant's on care maintenance at the moment while we look at what the opportunities are of taking the project forward. And I have one slide and we'll talk about what we're actually looking at, at doing there. So very briefly, we're a listed company and I'll point out the, the, the highlights on, on these slides. Um, most importantly, um, when we started out the year, we had about $54 million worth of debt and about $8 million in the bank. Um, it wasn't sort of the, the, the financial position that we wanted to be in, um, but there were things that we, we were looking at doing through the year. Um, and I, I'm sort of, Whenever we do payments, especially if this is on the day venture, sort of under the second signature, so I get to sort of push the button. Um, so I can say with hand on heart that um, we now have no debt and we're trending towards ending the year with north of $40 million in cash in the bank. Um, so an exceptionally good year for us. And as I go through the story, I think it'll paint the picture of how we've actually gotten to that point. But most people, especially sort of if, if you're not involved in the diamond <coughs> sector, um, to understand the supply-demand fundamentals, I've got to throw a couple of slides in. We'll just talk about exactly what the sector looks like. Um, when you look at diamond mining, um, we are we, we call it original production. So we're mining sort of extinct volcanoes. Um, the original sort of volcanic intrusion which brought the diamonds up from about 190 to 200 kilometers down. If we look at how many mines there are, original production mines, 28 is the number. There are only 28 hard rock diamond mines currently running on the planet. Um, and from those mines in 2006, they produced a record 176 million carats. It's a fairly decent pile of diamonds. But as you can see, as we've gone through, except for sort of bad year in 2009, there's been this steady decrease. And a lot of people, sort of as Zimbabwe and the Morangi diamond fields came on stream last year, a lot of people were worried that they were going to flood the down or flood the market with all these diamonds. And you can actually see, Zimbabwe's in there. Um, but it's not a, a, a huge increase. Um, actually, 2012 is exactly the same as 2010. The mines which are currently operating are getting to their economic limit. So these are open cost mines, so you start out, big hole in the ground. Um, a lot of these mines are now underground, so they're getting to the point where it just becomes too expensive to actually run the mine. Um, so what, what this slide actually shows is decreasing supply of rock down into the market. Um, but as we go forward, no real increase 
in the potential um, of what the new project can actually produce. So these are all the projects. Um, some of them have a, a fairly good chance of actually being put into production, and some of them don't have any chance of being put into production. And this one's a classic one, the Star Orion. Um, if you have three billion dollars, I have a diamond project for you, I'm sure that they'll be willing to sell, um, but you're not gonna make any money out of it. Uh, but if you look at these projects, they still actually only get, if all of them came on stream, they're still only gonna add 20 million carats a year. Mm -hmm. Um, if you looked at that in, in conjunction with 128 that they produced last year, it's still 20, 25 million carats short of the maximum. So in terms of what current mines and new projects can produce, there's no real uplift, um, especially if you look at sort of who are consuming diamonds. Um, and that's the more important one. The big increases that get bigger, India and China. So I always have to thank the beers whenever I present on, on diamonds. I and mean, it's without the beers, Really, yeah, diamond is a piece of carbon. Um, but De Beers is not just a, a diamond mining company. De Beers is a marketing machine. And about eight years ago, they took the, the, the same model that they used in Japan in the early 80s, and they went to China. And what they do is they institutionalize um, a diamond ring as a precursor to, to a wedding. Um, and as we, if we look at the numbers, um, when they did it in the US, it took around about 50 years to institutionalize it. And when we talk about institutionalization, it's getting to between 75 and 80 percent of all weddings being preceded by a diamond engagement ring. It took around about 35 years to get that to, to get to that point in Japan. They estimate it will take 15 years to get to that point in in China. And China already has gone from 7 percent of global consumption to almost 20 in less than three years. So China is definitely one of the, the, the keys to watch in terms of who are consuming diamonds. So we've got a huge increase in um, sort of the consumption of diamonds. Um, and this is, oddly enough, they're working to do these things. This is in, in um, billions of dollars. Here's a good example. From here to there is most only about $10 billion. Total production now is only $14 billion. The mines that are out there just cannot provide. What does that mean? Increasing diamond price. And it'll go up until we get to a certain point where people start to put in substitutes. Um, they'll go for a sapphire ring or a ruby or some other gemstone. Um, but for the for the future, at least the next 10 to 15 years, the supply and demand fundamentals for the diamond sector are very, very encouraging. And that's what we're here to take advantage of. So we're focused in Africa. Um, our key asset, the Karawe mine in, in the Arapa region in Botswana. Um, oddly enough, for those who, who, who sort of don't know, Botswana, the Switzerland of Africa, you must have heard that before, but also has a lower political risk rating than Canada. They are seventh on the list of over 207 countries. So it's a great place to work. Um, diamonds have been mined there for now 42 years. So the government actually understands how much value the diamond mines bring to the country. And we're actually able to leverage off of that. The other sort of project, um, we're 25 or a shareholder of the government of Lesotho who owns 25% of the project. That is our advanced stage project. Um, Lesotho, really small country. Um, challenges with Lesotho is they only have one mine in the country. So the actual available infrastructure which you can tap into, sort of to save capex and everything else, is not there. So you lump that onto your, your overall development cost and it starts to sort of make the project look not as rosy as what we would want it to look like. So when, when I spoke about the, the video is destroyed all my Oh, wonderful. So, um, when, when we when we look at the the, the overall um, development of the Koroi mine, um, we started out. Uh, we finished the feasibility study in July two thousand and ten. We gave the project go ahead. Eighteen month build in September of two thousand and ten. First diamond was produced. Eighteen months and four days. So we were four days behind schedule. But we finished the project in late. So first diamond was produced fourth of April, um, two thousand and twelve. Very very quick ramp up. By the 1st of July, we were running at design capacity, declared commercial production, and for the last six months of last year, we actually had a 9% ahead in terms of crunch process, 12% ahead in terms of carriage recovered. And it, it, it's great to be able to sort of show that the demand was actually working. More importantly, the resource was delivering. The block model that we had, the diamonds which we were supposed to be recovering, we were actually recovering. It was a big check mark. You always have a bit of a concern that um, maybe you sampled the rich area. Um, but the diamonds were actually coming out, and that was a good thing for us. But when I spoke about the, the exceptional group, it's stones like this one. That one is sort of, we, we want to recover another blue stone. 
um, $477,000 a carat. Um, there's just enormous value in it. And it still, it boggles my mind that for something which is so rare, um, people are still willing to pay top dollar. So I like to tell stories. Um, yesterday at uh, Christie's in Geneva, they set a world record. They sold a 14 carat vivid orange diamond for $2.4 million a carat. So $35 million for something which is not that big. That's what we talk about when we look at the, the, the things that are exciting within the diamond sector. Um, ours is actually even more so. They're not colored, but they're huge. Um, so th this stone, 239 carats, um, when it was actually washed, we, we do a, an HF wash, it went down to 227, and you'll see that in the, or 237, you'll see it in the presentation. So we were exceptionally encouraged when we recovered that stone. And we were busy putting the press release together um, and got a call from Scott saying, hang on a second, next day 123 carats. Next day, a 70 character. And so they continued to come. So, where were they coming from? When we started out, we actually started mining in the Norfolk. The grade was higher, it meant cash flow, more diamonds to sell. Um, in March of this year, we stripped the top two layers off of the center lobe, and we started mining through the center lobe um, into the south. So these are three distinct volcanic globes. Um, and within the very first production bench day, that's where the 239 carry came from. And as we mined across the bench, towards the south slope, these stones continue to come. And I think all investors are concerned that it was just a, a patch of large diamonds. Well done, you recovered a lot of diamonds, you, you sold them for $25 million, um, that's it. But I think if we look at the numbers, um, April we had 40, just quickly, in, in the diamond sector, any diamond which is larger than 10.8 carats is generally considered the special. Um, it's normally the stones larger than that that will be sold as single stones if they are of sufficient quality. So in April, we recovered 43 diamonds larger than 10.8. Not bad. Um, we thought it was pretty good. We got sort of a sort of decent parcel of large stones out of it. May was a, another month sort of slightly similar to what we've seen previously at 31. Then things started to change as we went through the transition from the, the center lobe into the south. In June, 59 diamonds larger than 10.8. July, 59 as well. August, 88. And in September, 96 diamonds larger than 10.8. So for the quarter, 243 diamonds plus 10.8. And I think the important thing to remember there is it's not a linear scale when you look at the valuation. Um, as your diamonds get bigger, and for all the husbands or fiancés, um, you will know, um, the bigger the stone, the more you're going to pay. And it's not a straight line. So when you get to a, a 30, 40, 50 carat stone, um, especially off if they are top quality, and I think the record that we've sold is over $60,000 a carat for a rough diamond as they get bigger into the 50, 60 carat range. So it's an exponential shift, not just as your size distribution, but also in the value of, of the stones which we have. So we were mining in this area, there's the 237, uh, 138, and as we sort of moved into the south lobe, and the south lobe being 72% of the, the, the reserve that we mine over the next 14, 15 years, um, we've now confirmed that we have a large stone population in the south lobe as well. And that gives us confidence that we're gonna see the large stones sort of into the future. I think when we start to look at um, what the, the, the resource was that we had previously defined, uh, because the deers did all the exploration, they check marked all the boxes. They did everything that they actually needed to do. But exploration people generally tend to do things as cost effectively as possible. So when they set up the process plant, they had a 10 millimeter top sum. Um, and important to note, diamonds are hard. You can't scratch a diamond. But if you hit it with a hammer, it's going to break. Um, diamonds are brittle in that they have a, a defined crystallographic structure. So the Beers was kind enough to send everything which was larger than 10 millimeters through a crusher. We have samples of exploration diamonds where 95% of the diamond was broken. But the breakage is so bad that you cannot lift the pieces and stick them back together to create the original large stone. But the plant that we have, the autogenous mill, is a much more gentle process. And that's why we're recovering diamonds in their full, so the original size fraction. And we have actually We've done breakage studies, so we have gurus who come in and they look at the stones, they value them, um, they look at things up in the microscope, and we're currently losing around about 3% of the revenue to breakage. Um, and that is a brilliant result. The beers on average for the processes that they use, lose between 14 and 17% of their revenue. So that's good, it means that the process plant which we've got is actually able to recover the large diamonds without significantly damaging them. Oh, just one thing on that. 
Um, in the video, um, those of you who were listening, it said 12 diamonds larger than 100 carats. Problem is, we're covering them at such a rate, it's now 16. Um, the video was done about eight weeks ago. Um, so again, it's the, the ongoing occurrence of these large stones, which is really starting to drive the value. But again, for, for us, it's, it's not just that we're recovering large stones. It's that we're generating a lot more points along the SFV, um, <coughs> sorry, the size frequency distribution, which means that the confidence which we have from a geostatistical perspective is much, much greater than anything that we've seen before. From 1.4 million tons of ore, 16 diamonds larger than 100, including three larger than 200. Um, I think the, the, the fear now is, as we continue to process, what's out at the end? Is there a 300 k stone, a 400, a 500 k stone? Two years ago, Petra sold a 503 k stone for $35 million. It's just a portrait of that. <laughs> um, so where we are, um, this here is the, the, the north slope. Um, that glass there is actually in the, uh, the, the center lobe. The three drill rigs, if you really squint on there, are sort of drilling in the south lobe. What we have is about three to four months of ore exposed. It gives us a lot of flexibility in the pit. Um, and at the boundary there, that's a little, you know, sorry, can't see it, it's a white hut. Um, that's at the further end of the pit. So when we've actually finished in 15 years time on the open calf section of the mine, we're looking at a hole which is about one kilometer by 800 meters about 320, 330 meters deep. There's a lot of ore still to extract from there. Um, so we're looking at sort of extending the life of mine, especially based on the results which we're getting. Mentioned the autogenous mill. Oddly enough, site is still at me. Um, it's one of the things which we, we, we really focus on. And there's a slide about sort of um, corporate social responsibility, health and safety, environment, etc. Um, one of the things that I can guarantee you, if you have a clean work site and you're looking after your people from a safety perspective, the production will come. It's one of the most important things. We'd rather have people work safely, and um, production comes second to that, but we know that they're linked. So if you take care of the one, the other will automatically come. One of the things which we were talking about was the autogenous mill. It's a nice gentle, it's almost an attrition process. So it's a, it, there's no impact. It's, it's sort of almost just breaking the material down in a softer fashion. But I'm hoping for my 500 carat stone. I won't ask them for it as a Christmas gift. We need to do one of these things first. The size that the plant can currently process, when we recovered the 239, it was 30. We've now gone to 35 millimeters. Um, problem is that we know that there's going to be something larger in there. Um, so what we're planning on doing is replacing the size distribution or the, the, the cut point on that screen, going up to 50 millimeters, and installing a large diamond recovery system. So before anything goes to the crusher, up to 50 millimeters, we want to take the diamonds out. Um, that single stone will pay for the capital program which we have set up for next year to install the large diamond recovery system as well as sort of upgrade the, the contribution as we get into the, 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 the crushing section as we get into the hard ore. So just some slides or some, some graphs. Uh, production is going well. Um, if you look at it, we're actually ahead in terms of tons processed, actually ahead in terms of carrots recovered. We're sitting on a mine core factor, so um, that, that's a measure of what we've actually recovered versus what the actual resource block model says we should, around about 3% ahead. Um, so in terms of our 420,000 carats sold, and we're definitely on target for that. But of course, it all comes down to money. Money is really what drives the, the economic decision on whether people should invest in the car or not. So when we started out, um, the beginning of the year, we had a $90 million revenue forecast. It was gonna be a tight year. Um, when we recovered the first set of large diamonds, we had um, our first large stone tender, um, actually large and exceptional, I like the word exceptional. Um, 15 stones sold for just short of $25 million. So we up our revenue forecast to 118. And as we've gone through the third quarter, we had another large stone tender. We also had a very, very good sale, 80,000 cash, $325 a cap. So where we sat at the end of the third quarter was revenues of $132.7 million, already significantly ahead. What does the future look like? We have 100,000 cash still to sell, and we have another large stone tender which closes the 25th of November. So in terms of revenue, we're most probably going to get to 170 plus. I would love to see a number of 180, twice our original revenue forecast. Um, the problem is, if we do that this year, everybody will want the same next year. So we'll see how things go. But I think where we are in terms of um, the financial stability, having paid off $54 million worth of debt, $40 million in the bank, which means our entire capital program next year is already taken care of, um, we're looking at um, from the $170 million of, of revenue, EBITDA around about 110. 
Um, and every time I mention that number to investors, they seem to be all very impressed, especially for a junior company who's actually only been in production for 18 months. One thing that I need to mention as well is cutoff for the sales, which we've got. So we've already had sort of 50,000 carats sold. Large time tender, as I said, closes the 25th of November. We have another 50,000 carats that's sold. Uh, most probably the, about the middle of December, and we'll close that sale. But cutoff has already happened. We already got all those down and set aside. So we have seven weeks left before the end of the year to continue to process. Um, just because I you know, like shiny things in the vault, um, in Gabron at the moment, we have a 167 carat stone, 122 carat stone, and 86 carat stone. Combined value from those three is already north of $10 million. They won't be sold as part of this large stone tender. They're already there for next year's first large stone tender. So by the time we get to the end of the year, on the 31st of December, we will already have between most probably north of $30 million of diamonds in the vault for sale in Q1 next year. So 20, 25% of our revenue forecast for 2014 in the vault before we process the first ton in 2014. So I get a lot of questions about sort of when you talk about diamonds, not all actually no mines are, are, the, are the same. If you looked at Arafa, the big mine, which is about 25 kilometers away from where Karo is in Botswana, their average value is sitting at about $87 a carat. Um, ours is now sitting north of 400 Actually for the, the third quarter, $625 a carat. Reminds me. I should jump around. Um, best selling diamonds for $625 a carat. It's costing us around about $110 a carat to, to produce. That's all in cash costs. The only thing you have to take off is the royalty. So we're looking at sort of $500 a carat margin. Um, it's a really, really good business to be in. But so the reason why we included this slide is really to show you the assortment of diamonds which we have. This is a picture of 80,000 carats of run of mine. This is straight out of the mine. They've been acidized. And all that slow mo the um, our diamond consultant has done, he's actually split them into specific colors, shapes, categories in terms of, of quality. So uh, down the side here, the best one is actually over here, which you can't see. Um, these are our first color diamonds. So these will be polished into D, E, and F um, color stones. They will be crystals, so very nice octahedrons, um, which you get the maximum yield from. These are stones where you'll get a 60% yield instead of sort of the normal 40 or 30. So these will be the, the highest value in terms of um, average dollar per carat, except for these puppies down here. And as you go down, you can see there's a change in color. These are all the same size or the same um, shape. So they'll be, if, if they're crystals, these will just be the different colors down, um, different sizes. These are cast as colors. We normally call them cake. Um, it's a slightly off yellow diamond. Um, Americans love those stones. Um, that's where the majority of the, the cake diamonds will end up. But it goes all the way down to we have our run of mine parcels. These diamonds here are only about two or three millimeters in size. So we, there's just too many diamonds to sort there, so we'll sell that as a run of mine parcel. A broker will buy it, and he will actually have people that will split it out, very similar to what you see here, and then sell those parcels on. But the average $408 a carat is a big weighted average calculation for everything that you see here. But interesting, what you see there is about 85% gem quality. So 85 or gem near gem, 85% of those diamonds will end up in a piece of jewelry, of which you can actually see in the average dollar per carat. If you're looking at below $100 a carat, you're looking at maybe 60 to 70%, which is going straight into industrial. Um, ours is much more sort of weighted towards the gem quality, the higher end goods. What's most interesting about this one is just the number of single stones. So all of those are plus 10.8 carat stones. The only ones that weren't sold was this one, um, 134 carats, that's in the large stone tender. And that one, which is 60, just over 62 carats, also in the large stone tender. Um, but otherwise, the proportion of um, diamonds there is really what we're, we're sort of driving the value. It's the, the high end value which comes from um, your single stone. Oddly you enough, know, that parcel there is also plus 10.8 carat stone. And that's a good example. You've got just beautiful gem quality stones over there, nice yellow stones, and a fairly sort of sizable pile of rubbish. It's rejections or, um, not a board parcel, there'll be rejections. Those ones will still be hammered into little pieces and they'll still find pieces that the, um, the 600,000 people in India that are polishing down will polish out of that. But when we talk about sort of what these are adding to the resource, that's where the numbers come from. That's really, as we change the size distribution um, and we've now moved fine diamonds which to be a bit created by breaking the large ones into the larger sizes, it's the valuation for these which we're now going to apply to the change in the size distribution. 
and it adds a significant amount to the NAV. Now, more because all the operating costs are already paid for, and it's those numbers which we are looking to put out as a resource update. This is probably the end of December, uh, sorry, end of January, um, Q1 next year. This picture's only for the ladies. It's just sort of um, what the mine is actually producing. And I only talk about this stone. We know the, 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 the sort of client that actually won the stone. It's been polished into two stones. Um, I think it's a 22 karat D flawless emerald shape. Um, yours for about $200,000 a carat. And a 21 karat round brilliant stone. Yours for about $250,000 a carat. So if you look at how much they, they paid for the stone, and making a lot of money. And that's exactly what we saw. The very first tender, um, we had what they call speculative stone. So if you looked at it with your naked eye, it's a slightly yellow stone, um, and the, the cutters don't really know what they're going to get out of it. But as soon as they put the stone on the wheel, they're getting D, so D, E, and F, first color stone. They were making 40% more than what they thought they were going to make. When we had the second large stone tender, our expectation was maybe $18 million, and all was said and done, they sold for almost sort of just short of course, $24.9 million. Um, and when we went back to ask them why, it's because the quality of the diamonds which they were getting was far better than what they thought. And that's how diamonds are priced. It's based on what the final, the value of the final product will be. I spoke about sort of um, the, the, the safety record and, and really the foundation for, for ensuring that production is actually working. Um, we have very good relationships with the, the local communities. I think everybody gets up and says that. Um, but I think sort of a lot of, as we said in the video, a lot of the practices which we We've become accustomed to in Canada, we've now adopted in Botswana. Um, and it seems to be going very, very well. On the time, um, it's, it's a bit of an orphan child at the moment. And it's, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. the, 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 the lack of infrastructure in, in Lesotho is really what sort of putting a bit of a, sort of a dent in the project. So all in, if we wanted to build the project, the, the, the camp, the plant, the mining equipment, etc., we're looking around about $220 million. Um, the mine site, however, is at 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet above sea level. The closest hydro station where we can actually draw power from is Muela. It's sitting at 1,400 meters above sea level. It's 60 million US dollars to get a power line from Muela to site, which is about, as the crow flies, about 55 kilometers. And then it's because of the topography. We're in, actually, Lesotho is only, apparently, the only country on, on Earth where um, the average elevation sits sort of um, above 1,700 meters. So we're in, we're, where we're looking at valleys and peaks, about an 800 meter differential from your valley to your peak. It is very, very treacherous terrain. So it's very challenging to get a power line in there. We looked at diesel fire generating, but you've got two um, significant sort of mountain passes that you have to navigate to get diesel into site. So the logistics of making the project work at the moment just don't make sense. Um, but we are looking at exactly how we can take the project forward and if you look, at Karoa is generating and it's producing very nice high value stones, large stones. Um, but the average value that we get for the stones out of Matai is about double what we're getting from, from Karoa. There's just insufficient diamonds to make it a, a sizable project, similar to what we have in Botswana. So in conclusion, 420,000 carats, and we're on target to produce that. Actually, we're on target to produce slightly more, and we'll sell 420,000 carats. The $118 million revenue forecast I think that's pretty much a thing of the past at 132.7 for the, the third quarter, for the first three quarters of the year. Um, and then, of course, as we go through, um, we have until uh, an agreement with the government, um, end of 2014, we need to have um, solutions presented for how we take Matai forward. Um, the strong cash flows which we're getting, the revenue generating potential of the large stones, and more importantly, the ongoing occurrence of these large stones is really what's driving the financials. Um, we're looking to end. 2014 with north of $17 million in the bank. That's after spending 30 to $35 million on a capital program in the first six months of next year. So Karawe is really turning out just to be a cash generating machine. Um, without, we got a, a, sorry, a third large stone tender in Q4. Um, and as I mentioned, we already have a small collection of stones, maybe five, for our first large stone tender in Q1, really carrying on the trend of ensuring that these, these very high value stones are adding revenue and really cash to the bottom line. I think one of the things that makes sort of Lucara different is um, we're now in production. It's not um, very similar to other diamond companies. We're not going out and trying to reinvent the study to hope that we can go out and raise money. And the results which we have have already been translated into a big pile of green notes um, sitting in the bank. It's actually a tangible asset that we can now talk about. And as we look towards the future, um, the, 
demand for large stones, especially the, 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 the plus 50, plus 100 k stone, just seems to be insatiable. People are there with thick, thick wallets to place bids on these large stones because you don't see them that often. And if you can go to a tender where there are four stones larger than 100 carats, the people bring a wheelbarrow of cash. Um, in, in terms of sort of the, the experience management and board, project delivered on schedule, ramped up in three months to maintain production, um, really good production over the last 18 months, um, dealing with challenges as they come, looking forward, actively managing the risk. And it's not that this was our first mine um, that everybody has worked on. If you took the, the, the entire sort of experience of our management, we've most probably put 20 mines into production. So we really were able to draw on that experience to make sure that Peroli was a success. And of course, the last point, we're a London group company. What are we gonna do with the cash? There's always a pause for effect there. Um, I think one of the things that makes the, the London group great is that they will not invest money in something which is a waste of money. And I think that's what most, especially in the diamond industry, there are so few players. Um, the people that are out there that have started before us, they went out and they raised loads of cash and they wasted it on dodgy assets, hoping that they could make it work. And I think one of the things that the London group companies do is very sound due diligence. They will not spend money and we will not spend money on something unless it is significantly value of Um What we do with the cash, I actually almost thought it because we agreed to pay a dividend, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but there are specific criteria which we look at in terms of the dividend policy closest to the end of 2014. Thank you very much.